Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Record Club episode of the Jams and Tea podcast for this week. Uh, this week, it is Sersha's Record Club, and we are discussing neutral milk hotels in the aeroplane over the sea. This is, of course, Sersha's last Record Club recommendation with us, and essentially a kind of farewell of sorts, since Sersha chose this record very much because it's a record that means an awful lot to her. And also, I think, secondarily, but also certainly I'm sure was part of it, the fact that it would definitely be an interesting record to discuss on this podcast, yeah. because obviously it's an indie classic, like it's well regarded, it's it's well heard and it's well discussed um and but yet we often overlook indie classics on this podcast and so it's nice to get to sit down and discuss one that might even be a little bit divisive who knows let's yeah. see um but it, it's a record that has a lot to unpack it's a record where i think you could make a lot of cases for the impact and power of it and yeah, I don't think I need to say anymore. I think, Sersha, this is a re- this is your recommendation. Why don't you talk about what this record means to you, why you think that it would be interesting for us to discuss, and if you want to even get into more specifically the things that you love about this record as well. Sure. Um, well, to introduce the Neutral Milk Hotel, um, these guys from Disbrook, that congregated around a city called Athens at a point in which there was a big explosion of independent music in that city. Um, among the label, which was never an official label, so has thus become known as a collective, that being Elephant Six, mm-hmm. um, uh, they had put out a number of lo-fi folk rock albums before Neutral Milk Hotel were even a thing. And eventually some of the key members, such as uh, iconic Jeff Magnum, amongst others, got together and they cut their first record on Avery Island, which I think is pretty good. Famously, I remember I was reading the 33 to 3rd book on this uh, album um, in the airplane over the sea, not on Avery Island, a little bit, a little bit ago. And something I found really interesting was how the producer of both in the airplane over the sea and on Avery Island was obsessed with the production on Revolver by the Beatles, but uh, sacrificed that aspect of his production instincts to channel what Jeff Magnum really wanted on on Every Island, um, in that fuzzy mess of chaotic noise. Mm-hmm. Um, and on In the Airplane Over the Sea, it was a bit more of a meeting of minds in terms of a production aesthetic. And I think that it really comes through on what's really exciting about the record. It's also true there is a lot of mythology around this record and and what it means um i i would just like to say that when i first heard this record i was 16 it was a big gateway for me into alternative music as i think it is for a lot of people it also came out i think less than a month after i was born in a year that i think is a particularly strong year for music that being 1998 and at the time i never thought about because I didn't know about it. I never thought about any of the popular conceptions about what this album means. I was just enveloped in what I felt to be particularly strong sonic and lyrical poetry. Um, Whether you want to talk about, we'll have to get into it, but whether you want to talk about Anne Frank or not, right? Like the fact is- You you can't not talk about Anne Frank when discussing this record. (laughs) What you can debate is the extent to which- um the lyricism actually refers to her um where, mm-hmm. where i think there are certain instances where it inarguably does and there are other instances yeah. where jeff uses her story and his emotional connection to her through reading her story as a means to explore various other themes with regard to relationships and sexuality and growing up mm as well like in a loss of innocence sort of thing i see a lot of yeah. um connections spiritually between this record and the first twilight sad album to me both records yeah. are about a loss of innocence in the process of growing up through experiencing tragedy and coming to terms with uh you know the finite mm. nature of life and the sometimes violent nature of the people that you tr- that you have to put your trust in and also the violent nature of relationships when you are in a pubescent state the way in which you 
exist and conceptualize yourself as against uh, the people around you and the way in which all of your emotional reactions to the people that mean the most to you are charged and sexualized and violent and all of these kinds of everything is so intense when you're a teenager yeah. and and this record is obliquely abstractly uh about that more or less yeah i think that's probably the best way to put it is that um although this album does make allusions to a real life person who existed um it is it is really about um a very deeply felt personal experience of what it is to sort of live at a certain time at a certain age that he is filtering through his relationship with the book he read that being the diary of Anne Frank um which in the 33 in the third book as much as they go into it he, he basically says that um he was just very inspired by this book that he was reading at the time that they wrote and recorded this album for me I think like you look at especially stuff in the last song as well as other songs where they talk about like in my dreams um she's alive and she's crying mm. or um like um those are images that for me even divorced from that story have an immense amount of power and truth about sort of life and how we relate to people and how we relate to the past as well like um i think this album's an album that rewarded me growing up and re-listening to it because of course it's about the tumult of adolescence so much and you know and frank of course was a really child but at the same time there's a deep feeling of a relationship with the past as well as the past of the world but the past of the self mm -hmm. on this album i feel like there's a deep relationship with um what it is to look back at a younger self on this record um who was that um deeply emotionally potent impassioned person and sort of slowly getting older and becoming detached from that younger person i feel like that's a deep subtext on this record that like um it's from a place of nostalgia from a place of like the opening track the king of carrot flowers especially the romantic um object in that song could never literally be Anne Frank, of course, because they talk about exploring each other's bodies in person and being young and learning what each other's bodies were for, to quote the record. Mm -hmm. um, and it's much more about a nostalgia of a more ideal time before tragedy hits, if that makes sense. And the tragedy is growing up. Yeah, well, it goes even deeper than that, I think. There's um, a couple of things I want to highlight that, that about the writing of this record is that well, one thing is uh, there's a lot of gender bending and the writing on this record, mm. a lot of um, curious uses of pronouns, particularly in the light of the themes that you've touched on. I'm not going to do this, but I think that someone who is so inclined could very easily, very easily, in fact, layer a trans reading on this record. Um, I would definitely be one that they have layered onto it. I can't say that I think it's clear enough that Jeff Mangum intends it to be this way, but there is a deliberate gen gender bending in a lot of the uh, lyricism on this record. For instance, that line where uh, the female subject of a song suddenly becomes a little boy in Spain playing pianos filled with flames. And there's lots of songs mm. that feel like they're about this figure who potentially Anne Frank represents my reading of it and i'd love to get in more in depth with it on certain songs but my reading of the Anne frank illusions is that she stands in um, beautifully as this emblem of mangum's childhood and his relationship with his younger self like one of the most moving moments on this record is uh in O comely where uh mangum sings I wish I could save her in some sort of time machine, but will she remember me 50 years later? And that's a curious line, right? Like it's this idea of wanting to go back and, and rescue someone from some kind of tragic situation, but also will she remember me 50 years later is a nonsensical line because you're reading about this, you're reading the story or you're visiting this past of this person and there's no way they could possibly conceptualize or understand your existence. So you're willing a relationship into being that cannot exist. You're willing to go back into the past and be able to save yourself when yourself would have no conceptualization of you in the yeah. future to understand it, that situation. It's, it's almost like a vertigo thing in a way. 
with this um, person who desperately wants to construct a feeling he feels very deeply with the person he can never physically realize that relationship with and um like i i feel like Anne frank um not to diminish the real human being that she was is a very interesting historical figure to map these ideas onto when such horrific things came into her life in the history of the world and this album is very much about a, a fear of something you have that is precious being taken away from you if that makes mm. sense yeah yeah and 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 although i think you can read the Anne frank references very obliquely in all of these ways it has to be noted and i think one of the reasons why this aspect of the records writing has endured so much is that it's a very present element of the writing and at points quite graphic as well there's poetic imagery and songs like two-headed boy which describe um un an unknown they placing fingers through the notches in your spine which suggests kind of like the skeleton of this deceased person um there's other lyrics on the record that don't immediately come to mind that refer to ash and like this person reduced to a, a literally a, a a dead thing and yeah. so there is a lot of allusions to Anne Frank her life her death and her spirit and her personality and Mangum's connection with that and love for her through that and what he sees in that story that pervades this entire record to the extent that I don't think it is a reach to say that conceptually she forms the backbone of basically most if not all of these songs and she is the lens through which Jeff examines these ideas. Mm. That's an important note that like it's just a lens in a way like the album like I often find it's that it's frustrating because you have to talk about it when you talk about the record but it's such a it's such a like it's also like a very surface level way to engage with the record in a way because like you have to engage with it because it's so central to it but the record is so much more like rich and about so much more about life than just this person who existed and the poetry reaches so much deeper and truer than just that historical account in my opinion Sure. Um, I think where people go wrong is that they see the focus on the Anne Frank story as the literary uh, focal point of this record. They see that as somewhat limiting or whereas I see it as the, the reason that it's so great, like the, the, the mining of meaning and beauty and sadness and tragedy that Jeff gets out of that and the way that he beautifully poetically ties that into his own frustration and and disaffection and emotional state of mind it, it, it's really really powerful and i think that people don't necessarily it's, i don't necessarily think that the focus on the anne frank story is misplaced i think you have to focus on that but i think that people don't you do. give uh don't, people don't really engage with what jeff is trying to do with those invocations and the emotional power of them uh in the context of the record itself and um, I think at this point, August, I'd love to hear from you because you haven't spoken yet. And I, I'm sure you'll probably have feelings on this and what you take away as the point of these songs and the relationship between what's happening here musically, lyrically, and this story. Yeah, yeah, this, uh, this I can, I, I just want to say first off as a personal note to Sersha, this was an album where when I first heard it, I was like, ah, yes, I knew why you liked it from the first like 10 seconds and <laughs> it it was readily apparent exactly the the appeal of of that to me um a lot of what i i took away from it in terms of the imagery and repeated imagery on here that i personally really liked was this repeated kind of mention of flowers uh like the king of carrot of carrot flowers being like the most obvious and direct one. And there's also the mention of the garden in O Comely. And a lot of that to me is kind of 
like it, it's I think a flower is a pretty direct metaphor for puberty and just coming of age it's kind of this record shorthand for that which is how I I I took that and a lot of that imagery and repetition of it felt like it was going for just kind of using using that in these song structures also is what I is what I'm trying to get around to in that these songs are primarily guitar driven for their first halves and then in their second halves they explode and add the horns and more orchestral uh, instrumentation and I think that's kind of the album's vocal metaphor for that burgeoning that coming of age developing into something grander and more interesting and just more fully realized even if that takes time to happen throughout some of these songs like O Comely's like only a guitar for its first like I want to say like seven mm. and a half minutes while the story itself is this kind of long tale of this uh, relationship between this family and I guess this young uh, girl, boy, wh whatever gender or sex is assigned to the protagonist. And then that breaking and that taking so long to like fully develop and understand itself, I think is a lot of what the musical ideas on this album are suggesting, kind of needing the time and taking the time to develop yourself and become fully realized and complete as a human being. And these songs are reflecting that in their instrumentation at points. Mm. yeah what i love about o comely is i probably my favorite song on this record just because it's so like beautifully written it's this sort of song about poisoned sexual that uh, poisoned perception of sexuality from someone who was growing up um surrounded by these kind of carnal uh depictions of it in their life and uh, a kind of sort of traumatized repression that comes out of that and uh, there's some really kind of complicated emotional ideas about sexuality and about coming to terms with it as a young person that are communicated on this record that I think are not really fully appreciated or maybe slightly misunderstood. Um, the awkwardness, the ugliness, the fear even of sexuality that a lot of young people experience. And I, it was meaningful to me because I... I, like Sersha, encountered this record as a teenager, and I encountered it because I was getting really into, like, the indie classics. Like, I was getting into this stage where I was getting really invested in hearing a lot of, like, classic alternative records from the last, sort of, 30, 40 years, and this record came up a lot for obvious reasons, and I, like, I, I at that point in time, I could, I, the only way I could find music and listen to music was on YouTube. And for whatever reason, this album wasn't available on YouTube. And so I had to like literally um, save up pocket money to buy it on iTunes to listen to it. And I would never, I would very rarely would I do that because I didn't have much pocket money at the time. Um, and I was like 13 or whatever. But this record seemed to be this kind of totemic thing and I so desperately wanted to hear it and engage with it that I did that and it was like one of those things where it was like the record was calling to me in a weird sort of way because when you listen to it at that age um, I, I can't I don't think I really understood much of it at all I could hear the tragedy and the sadness and that the way in which Jeff relates the tragedy of Anne's life to the tragedy of growing up and learning about the ugliness of the world and experiencing ugliness and feeling ugliness and the way in which Jeff, it's, it's not so much that Jeff sexualizes Anne. And I think that's something that gets slightly misinterpreted with this record as well. There is a love that he expresses and it is a love that reminds him of 
who he was at a particularly young stage of his life and the kind of ways in which he could have been different and done things differently and seen the world differently and the connection he forms with Anne as this kind of emblem of the way he wishes he could have been uh the 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 optimism that she has the resolve that she has the sheer realism but tough grit that Anne has and displays in her diaries that so moved him um, to the point where he's described weeping for days after first reading the book he sees this idea of the way he wished he could have been and the way he wished he could have been able to understand the world and the way he wished he could go back and retroactively change his own life and save her. And there's this beautiful melding of these complicated emotions that I don't think I really fully understood as a kid listening to this record. All I could really understand was that he found the story of Anne Frank terribly sad, as did I. But um, yet I connected with the way that Jeff Mangum emotes on this record, the way that he sings. He has a very powerful voice a very unique and singular and nasal voice, but one which he uses to great effect. Um, to, and he ha has this ability to be borrow these lyrics, refrains, and images into your head such that they take root there and they fester, even if you have no idea what they mean. Like when he, when in O Comely, when he kind of becomes slightly more reserved and he says, know all your enemies we know who our enemies are it feels like he is speaking to you directly and he's advising you in the way that he mm. wishes he could advise himself and yeah and and that's really at the heart of the record is is it feels like it beautifully captures this warped view of the world that you have when you're young and the ways in which your understanding of your sexuality and your identity and self by as an extension of that are something you that a lot of children are not able to acknowledge or understand or come to grips with because of the nature of the way that the world often discourages them from exploring those things and and that's what i find so powerful about the record is that feeling of uh confronting the fallout of that emotionally when you're a grown up and yeah it's it's just yeah gets me real bad yeah. that, that, oh, that's really the beauty of the ruddy album is that like you can listen to it at a certain age you get certain things out of it the more you grow up for me at least the more truth it has about the process of growing up and what that means to you mm. and that's probably what stayed with me for so long in the way other albums haven't um but uh i have other nice things to say about this record but i want i want to hear what uh, morgan has to say before i do that well hmm where to begin so we've we've kind of been building this segment up for a long time now as you know very divisive and that will you know i have the hot take about the beloved album and, you know, that's certainly true to some extent, but I, I do like the album. There, there are parts of it that I love. The title track, the part one of King of Carrot Flowers, uh, and especially Holland 1945, which, you know, to this day, I haven't really heard anything like that song. And that's, that's something that can be said of the whole album, really. It's just a, a shame from my perspective that for as wonderfully written as it is consistently, I find the, the musicality of it kind of inconsistent um, in the ways in which it grabs me. And I don't necessarily know how to articulate that either. I can't explain exactly to you why like I adore the title track and like oh comely does next to nothing for me i, d I don't fully get it myself it's, it, it bugs me it's like something that sticks in your craw for like it's like when you eat popcorn and you get a little bit stuck in the back of your throat but it's been like that for like seven years now 
I think mm. not to denigrate the musicality of this record, which I love, but I also think to a certain extent that it almost works best even just on the purely lyrical level. Like a lot of my favorite mm. songs and moments on this record, uh, the music is, I, I enjoy the music a lot, but it's almost incidental in a certain extent because of what is really taking me with it. Like one of my favorite pieces on this record is um, the two-headed boy duology, uh, parts one and two. But I don't necessarily resound all that much with the music on those songs. But I think the lyricism is some of the most heartbreaking uh, that I've ever heard, particularly in the second part, where you have this almost like resolving into this darker nihilistic place after a kind of because like with ghost and then the untitled track that follows it it's almost this cathartic climax of the record where jeff takes from Anne's resolve a an ability to uh find a strength within himself um through her and then it's like two-headed boy part two comes in at the end and the music goes from that explosive melodic sound of ghost and the untitled track to this much more withdrawn place again mm. where Jeff is just lamenting and he's basically longing and, and, and he does it in a way that's very like, it's, it's discomforting. And even when I listen to the record now, I do find it discomforting. Like I feel like I'm hearing something I shouldn't be hearing to a certain extent as well. It's this confessional, like especially when he does scream those lines, like in my dreams, you're alive and you're crying as your mouth moves in mine, soft and sweet. Uh, and and also the, the references on this song as well to a friend of Jeff's who committed suicide by shooting himself uh, and the way he describes uh, him being left with his head filled with flames and watching as his brains fell out through his teeth and then heartbreakingly Jeff describes wanting to push the pieces in place to make his smile sweet to see again trying to reconstruct this memory of this person who's dead even though all he has left of them is 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 that violent ending uh it's gut-wrenching and it's it's uncomfortable yeah. and it's 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 very difficult to process and especially for a record that feels like it has such a, an emotional arc to it that then ends with lines like, God is a place you will wait for the rest of your life, which is a spine chilling lyric in context. And, I, yeah, I do love um, that line a ton. And, I mean, the thing about that lyric is like, I'm not entirely sure what it means to me, but it compels me a whole bunch yeah well that's the thing like if you read through the song like jeff basically explain you can get the meaning reasonably easily by reading through the context but you do have lines like that that stand out even apart from that as these kind of show-stopping moments but um yeah it's the emotional complexity that i keep coming back to with this record and i can see why when certain aspects of the music don't appeal to you that that can be uh i guess slim reward for uh other aspects of it being so i guess and then like disconnecting for for some people I, I will say i am uh i am also not entirely unsympathetic to how morgan feels about the parts of this album because i i kind of also feel a bit of that lack of engagement with some of the instrumental parts myself uh i i just feel i i'm able at points to get a little more out of the lyricism than maybe he does but i also don't really entirely disagree with your points at all morgan i tend to have a lot of similar feelings that the the tracks you mentioned are very like just head and shoulders stand out as these really significant standout moments in the track list, which are for me almost so all encompassing and, and great in terms of that, that balance of both the instrumentation and the writing that I feel, I, I almost feel they just dwarf the rest of the record in a way yeah, I, I definitely see what you mean there. Like, I, th I think the reason why Holland 1945 is my favorite song on the album is because it so expertly combines the lyrical craft that 
permeates this album and the sort of really instrumentally compelling and enthralling and exciting material on it all into one mm. pretty concise track like the 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 fucking whacked out fuzzy ass bass that comes in after the one two three four like i i am I, i'm addicted to that just as i am addicted to the 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 bit of imagery uh, but then they buried her alive one evening, 1945, with just her sister at her side. And only weeks before the guns all came and rained on everyone. Now she's a little boy in Spain p- playing pianos filled with flames on empty rings around the sun. I'll sing to say my dream has come. Like, what the fuck does that mean, dude? But like, it's it has stayed with me since the mm. first time I heard it. I think of the fucking little boy in Spain playing pianos filled with flames like probably twice a week. What I, it what has I, a resonance, what, right? What yeah. I think it, what I think is significant about it, just to tie back to the sort of theme stuff I was saying earlier, is that obviously Jeff sees a kinship with Anne Frank as uh, between his childhood self and her, and her representing things that he wished he could be, but also her tragedy making that all the more bittersweet, and the idea of. Uh, her dying and then being reborn as a little boy in Spain, kind of suggesting in a sense that maybe he believes that he is her in a certain sense. Like his childhood yeah. self was like, if not a literal reincarnation of her, then a kind of like so akin to her that essentially she was reborn in him. And that, uh, and that, yeah, and that's quite powerful, I, I think, as well. Mm. And and the other thing about Holland 1945 that's great is that you have that barreling sound and that intense, great uh, musical arrangement, so much so that you almost have, like, so many great lines and couplets on the song that it's almost difficult to keep I, up. It's it's just one after the other. Like, I I, mm. I love the, the second verse where it's, now we ride at the circus wheel with your dark brother wet, wrapped in white, says it was good to be alive, but now he rides a comet's flame and won't be coming back again. The earth looks better from a star that's right above from where you are. He didn't mean to make you cry with sparks that ring and bullets fly on empty rings around your heart. The world just screams and falls apart. I mean, where to yes. even begin there? That is ridiculous. The earth looks better from a star that's right above from where you are. It's like tattoo worthy lyric. I absolutely yeah, love right. that line. But like the thing about that fucking song is like uh, it ties together the sense of like cosmic justice about this album. Where if, I, I almost feel like the real crux of this album is contextualizing Anne's life in something greater and what that song does so beautifully is it takes this life that it details in such meticulousness and um, frames it within something fucking cosmic mm. um, literally, literally in the lines what a curious life we've found here tonight there is music that sounds from the street there are lights in the clouds Anna's ghost all around hear her voice as it's rolling and ringing through me soft and sweet how the notes all bend and reach above the trees that's l- what you're saying is exactly mm. what's in those lyrics on the title track that sense of a cosmic exactly. greatness in her life that and in any life of any teenager and of any child mm. and that sense of grandiose grandiose profoundness that jeff sees in it yeah i uh, like the thing that i think jeff sees in it is like that the and frank's story the reason it res- resonates with humans across the world is that it's essentially an incredibly exaggerated version of what growing up is and he takes that and extrapolates that growth of scale to the universal um, and uses it to make statements about the nature of existence itself. And it's just fucking baffling. Yeah, because it's like, it is this, it is a typical growing up story. Like it is a diary of a typical girl growing up, living a typical life and experiencing typical teenage girl experiences. And then suddenly uh, this overwhelming unfathomable tragedy begins to unfold and then 
goes beyond the story and and that mm -hmm. tragedy is like you say an exaggerated version of the the loss of innocence trope that um you know that artists have mined for millennia and but yeah. is is perhaps no more profoundly expressed than by the abject sudden end of Anne Frank's story and the way that Absolutely. that makes us feel as we experience it reading the book or hearing about it um, there, there are two things I want to touch on before I have said all the things I really want to touch on and they're somewhat intertwined and they are the pacing and the instrumentation and how it how the instrumentation develops across this record um, and this basically, it opens on the King of Clap Flowers, part one, and it opens on a very pop-friendly uh, chord progression that's really like 70s folk of um, the C to a G to an F in this very pop-friendly chord progression. And it starts off as this tale of sort of innocence burgeoning into maturity in this tale of the King of Carrot Flowers. And it introduces... Uh, introduces these ideas of abuse and learning that um, life isn't so simple as one might think it would be. Um, and then as it transitions into two and three, it introduces an organ and fuzz guitars and an upbeat tempo um, to basically introduce the ideas that um, we have this idealized idea of the childhood, you know? Um, and it's almost like the introduction of these instruments is to say that um, although the future of growing up is challenging, there is deep catharsis and fun in it that's introduced by part three, where it just goes, ba, 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 da, ba, da, ba, 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 and the, guitar, the drums are playing double time, and the fuzz is laid on thick. Mm -hmm. It's basically saying, like, as you grow up, things are complicated, like, things get more complicated. But um, it gets, but the added complexity leads to new ideas of what being alive means. Mm. That's incredibly enticing and cathartic and promising. I guess. I love the way that uh, that whole struggle is uh, summarized in a line and a couplet like, "I will float until I learn how to swim inside my mother mm. in a garbage bin." Like that that idea of of the rebellious sense of of purpose and, and edge that you have as a teenager despite the ugliness of your situation and uh yeah and then it's 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 yeah it hits really hard and i'll also say that i in all of the music that i've heard you make sersha in all of it without fail i can hear the three parts of the king of carrot flowers to some degree like it's <laughs> just it's just embedded in, in all of it and that is the highest of compliments because it's such a classic way of, of opening and, and leading in this album introducing all of the lyrical themes and the instrumental variation that the rest of the record is going to explore in a more measured way that makes me so incredibly happy i can't even tell you yeah no worries and I, that's obviously chimes with what august said about when he first showed put this on and said oh yeah no this yep social core right here yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah so it's beautiful I, I, that we are talking about it now. I, I could just stop listening right now and be happy. Like, uh, but no, uh, next is the title track, In the Aeroplane Over the Sea, which is for me the perfect title track in that it, feel, it feels like the eye of the storm of the whole album. Like it's the one moment of unequivocated peace and beauty that exists on the whole record. Helped by one of my favorite instruments to hear play properly on a whole album, that being the theremin, uh, which, which also uh, reappears on Ghost as well, quite meaningfully it, in the last part it, of that track. It does. Famously, the theremin was invented by someone who wanted to make an instrument that anyone could play by placing your hand along heights above the thing but inevitably made it impossible to play by being so straightforward and an, in an instrument that has a sound that is typically described as ghostly or haunting and so when it's mm. used here it works beautifully as this musical representation of the spirit uh overhanging the music whether you want to think of it as the spirit of Anne specifically or the spirit of a you know of a lost childhood or whatever it's it's a beautiful use of, of instrumentation on this album 
it absolutely works on both levels, especially due to like, how do I put this? The beat of this album is a naive, the beat of this song is a naive one where it feels like there is seen, um, there is seen by the narrator a positive ending that exists only for the length that this song is, is, is playing. And it, it's, it just feels like the one moment in like, if we were alive in the 70s, this song would be the moment that uh, we all get around a campfire and it's all okay for one evening. That's that so, and the in, the way the instrumentation is stripped back, with the exception of that fucking theremin, mm-hmm. sort of encapsulates that for me because that's like it doesn't discontinue the beauty and catharsis of the feeling, but it takes it into a new plane of understanding, where it, it, it takes it from being this moment of like joy amongst a very dark and cathartic album, but takes it into a place where it becomes like a memory of a great time you once had when the theremin comes in. It's like, yeah. it's, it it's becomes also, something we're remembering. Also here's my, what I think is the most enduring lyric of this whole album, which is, uh, I can't believe how strange it is to be anything at all, which is yeah. like this beautifully existential line, but also kind of like a bitter, not a dourly sad one, but a bittersweetly beautiful one in context. Like, what a beautiful face I've found in this place that is circling all around the sun. I love the way that comes back full circle. But when we meet, when we meet on a cloud, I'll uh-huh. be laughing out loud. I'll be laughing with everyone I see. I can't believe how strange it is to be anything at all. Like that idea of, of dying and moving into this next realm beyond death and just laughing at the cosmic hilarity of your existence like it's it's just like it's beautiful beyond words Mm. there's a beautiful like intimacy in the writing here like obviously it's a record about sexuality and intimacy and stuff but i love the way that in the song jeff describes reading Anne's diary as uh pushing my fingers through your mouth to make those muscles move like that's a beautiful way of describing reading someone's diary. Like you're literally using your fingers to make the voice, the speaking of the other person happen in your head. Um, I love that. And there, that's a, a great example of the kind of like almost uncomfortably intimate lyrical style that yeah, Jeff uses like, across the record. It, it's, it's like, it's beautiful, but it is also just a little bit gross. Yeah. Which I think <laughs> is, a tr- but that's, I think it's a truthful representation of, of, those emotions and how you experience them. It, yeah, um, it's certainly yeah. representative of youth. Yeah. I mean, the album is frequently gro- gross and distasteful, but I l- kind of love that about it and that it represents like a very darkly truthful aspect of relationships whenever it's gross. Across the album, it gradually gets more instrumentally dense and fuzzier and almost like dream poppy shoegazier the longer it goes on, um, especially on the sort of oh, comely, comely distorted ghost section, so much noise is introduced that it feels like it's alternating between the noisy catharsis that is adolescence and the more fuzzy, area moments that are reflecting on your most transgressive, dangerous, darkest moments that come with enacting on those adolescent impulses. Beautifully said. And very true. Anything else that anyone else wants to add? August, anything you want to add? Oh, yeah. Just one more thing I wanted to mention that I like the uh, Untitled Instrumental on here a lot. That's one of my favorite moments. I love the uh, real spark and uh, bombastity that had. And I thought it was such a, a good, like, transitionary point in like the best sense of the word possible like Mm -hmm. that that to me is what an interlude track is and should be because it is just so unique singular and exciting on the record yeah yeah and that's the thing is that this record still excites me to this day and i if anything am closer to it than ever weirdly the more distant I get from the childhood I experienced it in and I think that's part of 
what Jeff is trying to communicate as well and the emotional place that he's coming from. Okay. Well, favorite tracks and ratings then for In the Aeroplane Over the Sea. Uh, August, why don't you go first? My three favorite tracks are definitely uh, The King of Carrot Flowers Part 1, In the Aeroplane Over the Sea, and Holland 1975. Uh, my least favorite track <laughs> on here. 75. 45. 45. Uh, and my least favorite song on here is, uh, I guess, The Fool. I would give it a 7 out of 10. Amazing. Morgan. Uh, as I have mentioned, Holland 1945. Uh, but I will also follow that with King of Carrot Flowers Part 1 on the title track. Uh, least favorite, I have to say, Oh Comely, which is like stunning as that song is lyrically. I I find it quite tedious instrumentally. Uh, and I will give the album a six and a half. Well, I'm going to make a big change to both the standard deviation and the mean here. Naturally. Uh, when I, yeah, when I say that my favorite tracks are, wow, all of them, but specifically, um, Oakhamley, let's say, Holland 1945, and Two Headed Boy, which I didn't really get a chance to mention, but it does I mean, a really cool progression thing where it, it starts on the, the key chord that is the base of the song. And then it takes to the note that defines it as a major chord in the first place and plays that note as a full major chord. And it feels harmonious because it's part of the triad, but it's also weirdly dissonant because it's including a lot, of, a lot of notes that aren't part of the bass key. And I think that's just really cool whenever I hear it in music. And uh, Two Edit Boy does it really beautifully. If I choose these favorites. So Thank you, Adam Neely. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. That was really beautiful to hear because you've just Ashamed. articulated you've just articulated in music language a feeling the song gives me that I couldn't put into music language. Ashamed to say that I only watch Adam Neely because he is hot. <laughs> valid. He is hot. It's true. That is valid. And Neely, if you're watching this, you're hot. We'll never I'm watch sure another knows. one of our videos ever again if he does. <laughs> yeah. So that's a 10 from me. Okay. My no. Uh yeah, I also I also second the shouting out of two head the two-headed boy duology, which I did shout out in the video, but I want to emphasize that's some of the most dark and moving and, and upsetting lyricism on the whole record. And I think it's some of Jeff's best. My three favorite tracks are O Comely, Two Headed Boy Part Two, and In the Aeroplane Over the Sea. My least favorite track is The Fool. And I'm giving this album a 9.5. Amazing. Um, so on average, that's an 8.3, which I think I can be very happy with, um, which is equivalent to uh, a lot of albums. So I would take a smattering of them. Uh, Spiritual Healing by Death, Man Alive by Everything Everything, RTJ4, the Gantz Graf EP, uh, Microphones in 2020 by The Microphones. I, I predict that Jake will not bring the average down when he listens to it. No, I wouldn't it. think so. So we can we can ho hopefully await that. But yeah, let us know at home what in the airplane over the sea means to you. Uh, what are your interpretations of the record as well? Obviously, we didn't have a lot of time to get into the nitty gritty, but we'd love to hear what your thoughts are on this album. Let us know in the comments below. Make sure you like and subscribe as well if you haven't already. It means a lot to us, helps us out. And make sure you go and check out our main episode this week where we discuss the new records from Casey Musgraves and Lowe and stick around for our 1991 retrospective in two days' time where we discuss Nirvana's Nevermind. Um, August, it remains to you to send us out as per. Right. As, every, as always, everyone, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Delta Airlines. We love to fly and it shows.